Welcome to the Serious Leisure Podcast. My name is Petya Petrova and I'm your host for this special episode today. Today we focus on social prescribing, what it is, how it can be used to support our well-being. We of course also explore what parallels exist between social prescribing and serious leisure. As usual, we are joined by our resident expert, Dr. Sam Elkington. Sam is joining us from Teesside University, and he's the co-author of the Serious Leisure Perspective book together with Professor Stebbins. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Kat Branch is joining us today in the capacity of an expert guest. She will share her experiences and involvement with social prescribing at UE. Kat leads the UE Centre for Music. Welcome, Kat. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Fetia. Thank you. We are also joined by Mary Pring. She is UE's Centre for Sport Active Lifestyle Officer. Welcome, Mary. Would you uh, introduce yourself to us a little bit more? I know that all of our guests have numerous additional roles at the university. Hi, Petia. Yeah, so I'm Active Lifestyle Officer at the Centre for Sport. Um, I'm also responsible for delivering the social prescribing programme that we run for students at the university, which is living well. Thank you. We're also joined by Liz Jenkinson. Liz is a senior lecturer in health psychology and co-chair of the U.S. Health University Group. Welcome, Liz. Would you just uh, introduce yourself to our audience, please? Hi, everyone. Yes, as Petia says, I'm a health psychologist, so I'm really interested in the psychology of health, illness and well-being. And I co-chair the Health University Group here at UWE, who oversees health and well-being initiatives across all our campuses. So um, I've been a bit involved in social prescribing here at UWE. Um, and that's what I'm here to chat to you about today. Thank you. And finally, we are joined by Nicola Holt. She is a senior lecturer in psychology. Welcome, Nicola. Hello, welcome, everybody. Yes, I'm a lecturer in psychology at UWE, and I co-lead with Liz, a special interest group on the arts and health. And I'm also involved in evaluating a number of arts and prescription services in the local community and at Southmead Hospital. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you all. We are extremely grateful for, well, to all of you for making time, joining us today, and for your expert contributions. So today we're going to talk about social prescribing, what it is, how we use social prescribing here at UWE to support student well-being. We'll also explore the parallels between social prescribing and legitimizing time for leisure and the concept of serious leisure. Before we jump in, we need to figure out what this social prescribing is. Uh, and I was wondering, Liz, if you start us off with that and just tell us a bit more about what social prescribing is. Yeah, so social prescribing is all about primary care professionals connecting people with community resources with the aim of improving health and well-being. They might be activities like exercise, arts, gardening, cooking, and more. Importantly, the activities are not pharmacological. They are non-clinical. They are about engaging in what we might call leisure pursuits with the aim of improving health and well-being for those who engage with them. And they sit in a holistic model of understanding health and well-being. There are different models of delivering this, but typically they include a link worker or a community navigator who helps uh, patients, clients, people to um, find a good fit in terms of the activities that they're going to engage in. So to sort of maximise the potential for them to um, improve their well-being and health in the area in which they are presenting to primary care. Now, what's interesting is we're seeing that grow outside now of primary care and NHS services into other organisations. So um, as we've mentioned, we're starting to do this at UWE. Um, and using some of these models in other areas to link people up with activities that might improve their health. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for this very full um, description. I, at this stage, I, I'm wondering if um, Nicola can come in with a further description of social prescribing from her perspective and her work. And then I'll pass on to Marie, who can tell us about what does this actually looks like at UWE. 
Um, yes, so my involvement with social prescribing focuses on art on prescription in particular, and based on my interest in creativity and the psychology of the creative process and its links with well-being and mental health. And um, I've been helping evaluate a new number of community programmes where people typically with anxiety and low to moderate depression, but also other things like chronic pain, are referred to art workshops to see if these can improve their well-being through um, psychosocial um, mechanisms where it's hoped that through social bonding and other resources through engagement with the art activities perhaps distraction from pain and anxiety this might improve their well-being and it's also been used in secondary care increasingly so for example there's an arts on referral program now at Southmead Hospital working in specific client groups that chronic pain and chronic breathlessness. So this prescribing model seems to be becoming more widespread and indeed we're piloting it in a university setting. Thank you, Nicola. I'm wondering whether either Nicola or Liz um, can tell us a little bit about what's the secondary care. I've never heard of this uh, as a term and if you could just tell us a little bit about it. Nicola, can, can you try explaining this to us? Yeah, well, secondary care is, um, Liz might be better at defining this, being a health psychologist who works in different um, health settings. Um, but yeah, secondary care, as far as I'm aware, is um, places like hospitals rather than community um, settings like general practitioner surgeries. Secondary, secondary care involves um, hospitals, etc. So when I refer to hospital um South Mid Hospital using an arts and prescription model within secondary care. That's um, what I was referring to there, the hospital. Thank you so much for that. Liz, is there anything you'd like to contribute uh, uh, to, to Nicola's description or we covered this sufficiently? You're nodding, so I think we've covered this sufficiently. Oh, no, just, just a tiny thing. Um, specialist care. So what's interesting is that we're seeing this move, as Nicola was saying, into specialist areas of care. So cancer treatment, pain management, for example, um, so it, it, uh, primary care is generic care, you know, your, your GP, your, your community nurses, um, in the sense that people present with a range of issues, um, which is where a lot of this social prescribing started. But when we're moving into specialist care, we're working with particular groups of patients who may have a similar physical health or, or mental health um, presenting symptom or issue that they've come for help with. So, um, yeah, absolutely. As Nicola was saying, we're now seeing um, some evidence and interventions around particular groups of patients who might benefit. Thank you. And I guess that then raises the question is if we're talking about social prescribing in terms of healthcare, but we are doing something around social prescribing here at UE. And as far as I understand, Marie, this was all your idea or something you see started. Um, so um, Marie is, 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 is smiling timidly and not taking full responsibility for her excellent work she's been doing. Marie, can you tell us about how you adopted the social prescribing here at UE for our students? Yeah, of course. I, I don't think it's fair to say that it was solely me that came up with the idea. But um, yeah, so we developed a programme back um, a few years ago now um, around exercise referral. Um, and within that programme, we got quite a lot of attention as to what we were doing and why we were doing it. So the students that we were working with were students who had been supported by um, UE Wellbeing, so the UE Wellbeing Service, um, and had been identified as students that maybe didn't need that clinical support, but did need something. So I started to work with the students who've been referred on to this programme, the exercise referral programme. Um, and whilst we were uh, taking part in that program that year, um, we started to get quite a lot of attention from um, different areas of the university as to what we were doing and why we were doing it, um, and people kind of wanting to be a part of it. So um, Kat, Liz and Nicola, all on, on this podcast today, um, all kind of jumped on board and wanted to get involved. So um, it's it's grown from there. So um, three years down the line, we now offer um, a range of activities, whether it's art, music, exercise, gardening, or volunteering um, to students as part of um, a steps level of care from the wellbeing service um, and other referral channels as well. Marie, before I pass on to Kat and just ask her for, for her angle on, on, on all of this, I'm really curious about how this does this actually work? So we have a student who um, has sought support from the wellbeing service. Can you just talk us through the journey and what actually happens, please? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the students who present at the wellbeing service, um, they have a, a triage appointment when they first present at the wellbeing service. Um, I also mentioned there's a couple of other channels as well. We also work with um, the University Health Centre and Huey Cares as well. Um, so there are those three channels that can refer students onto this programme, but it is predominantly the wellbeing service. So what happens is the wellbeing service identify the needs that that student has. Um, so whether it's um, clinical support that they might need um, or whether it's a, a different level of care that they might need. And one of the channels that they can refer on to is Living Well, which is our social prescribing program. So what happens is the, the student then comes to myself, who I, I meet with the student and I kind of discuss what the program's all about. Um, they then are linked up with one of our link workers um, who are actually student placement um, from master's health psychology students. Um, so they meet with their link worker and they work with their link worker to um, understand what their barriers are to activity um, and also what their motivation is and how we can get them um, involved in a healthy lifestyle activity. Um, so one of the, the activities that I previously mentioned. Um, from that point, we start them all off together. So they they create a bit of a bubble, essentially, a social bubble where they're able to engage with the students on their specific activity throughout the six weeks of their program. Um, we then continue to work with those students throughout the six weeks to make sure that their needs are being met. And if there's anything else that they might need, we can support them as well. Um, myself and the link workers and also the activity leads. Um, and then following on from the six weeks activity, we meet with the students again and we speak about the next steps. So it's really important for us to make sure that they're not just let go at the end of the six weeks, that they've got something that they can continue to take part in. So whether it's a referral into something within the university or within the community, we can look at what what would be best for them. So what I'm going to ask you now is um, move on to Kat and ask Kat two questions. Question one is, well, Marie said that you became very excited about the social prescribing uh, initiative and you joined in. And question two is, you are very keen for us to include an episode on social prescribing on our series Leisure podcast. And why and, and how did you see the link between those two? Well, <laughs> here comes a massive monologue. No, I'll keep it snappy. Um, you're absolutely right. I got very excited when I heard about what was happening with the exercise on prescription because my own background um, involved setting up a lot of music and drama projects here with different vulnerable people here in the Southwest. I especially focused on secure environments. So um, I worked with uh, young women, 16 to 18 who were incarcerated. I worked with lifers. I worked with young offenders, a huge range of different individuals at different stages of their journey and with different experiences. But what I found was that music and drama, but music most particularly, had this incredible uh, capacity for, for a kind of pro-social intervention for those individuals. So I know this might feel like a leap to say, wow, I mean, we're talking a kind of about a clinical thing or uh uh, it's sort of something quite different to serious leisure, which is where we have focused our podcast so far. But for me, the link is about the fact that um, when we look at the social prescribing model, it can help to legitimize our own personal internal narratives where we battle with making time for ourselves. Because what, seri what um, social prescribing does is it, it draws on an enormous and significant evidence base. So the fact that it's now available you know, for example, uh, a social prescribing worker, that there should be one in most GP surgeries now. I mean, the, the amount of hours they've got available, maybe minutes, but there is, there's somebody there. And what that says is the evidence base is strong. It's enough um, to show us how transformational and high impact these so-called leisure activities can be. So I wanted to introduce it because it gives us a a kind of an additional lens to look at it. I'm not saying the two discourses are the same, and I know Sam's going to have some brilliant insights on this and draw out some of the overlaps and indeed some of the tension between these two models. But I do think it really helps us to take even more seriously our own commitment to leisure time for ourselves, for our colleagues, and of course, for all the students that we work with, because we know how important and what a huge impact this kind of approach can have. So that's my big sell on why I wanted to look at social prescribing. And I know my my whole freelance career as a musician and the kind of arts and health practitioner has seen for myself um, the amazing effect that some kind of you learning a musical instrument, joining a choir, uh, being in a band 
um, can have enormous um, effects, personal well-being and also on social well-being, uh, reducing violence, um, uh, reducing um, um, harming behaviours, that kind of thing. So there we go. So I thought it'd be a very helpful and interesting discussion for us to have to compare these two. Sam, I wondered, would you mind just commenting from what you've heard so far on perhaps some of the parallels with the serious leisure discourse and maybe some of the tensions and some of where those where those pathways diverge for us? Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting listening to the kind of more formal definitions of social prescribing here and, um, the, and then parallel that with how we understand leisure or how we experience leisure, you know, leisure being predominantly done uh, under you know you, there's no coercion there there's it's it's a free it's about free will freedom of choice um you know you, you're free to make the choices that are best suited to your uh your circumstances and your, your own motivations and interests largely that's not always the case but largely so the idea of being prescribed something does at least kind of philo philosophically challenge that kind of freedom of choice freedom of of, of expression but i like the way uh, the the idea of social prescribing has been has been set out there. Um, so uh, Marie's point around you know um, working with people's motivations and interests. So you know it, it's prescribing, but it's also there's a dialogue there. So being able to work with and, and find that hook for people in terms because that hook ultimately is going to be where the the commitment comes from and you know, hopefully longer term commitment and leading to those kind those benefits that you're hoping to reach. Um, but the, the parallels with with serious leisure are interesting because serious leisure typically starts, at, you know, very often starts as a casual endeavor, i.e., you know, we don't we don't enter into a serious leisure pursuit fully committed and bought into this unique ethos and environment and, and worldview or, or an activity, uh, whether it be, you know, playing in a band or, you know, learning to rock climb or, or, or whatever, you know, it's something you, you grow into. And I think um, th there are parallels there in terms of the journey. So it, I think it might be useful just at this point. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring some some key features out here uh, of serious leisure, and then we can we can maybe talk around those. So, in terms of key characteristics, what we have typically is a, a, a need to persevere with an activity. Like I just said, you know, you don't turn this on at the wall normally. It's something you grow and it emerges as an emergent kind of part of that motivation. Also, the availability and possibility for growth over the long term. So being able to see that, understand that, and, and, and be able to trace that out. Um, so the need to put in a certain amount of effort and gain a certain skill or level of skill and, and, and knowledge. So it's for very many, many people, this will be, these will be new activities or there'll be activities they're familiar with and they've liked, they like the idea of being involved in, but they don't have any previous with it. So actually needing to develop those skills and that knowledge base is important. Um, but through that, starting to realize some of the, the special benefits of uh, being associated with being involved in such activities. And uh, we've already heard um, the, the importance of, I uh, think, uh, Mary, Mary, you were talking about they're in their own bubble uh, or, you know, little, little social groups. Well, that, you know, that's the, a unique social ethos tends to build up around these more serious pursuits. And that's important. That's an important hook. And it's very often what draws people in. So in, in, in other conversations and in, in previous podcasts, we've we've heard about that, you know, the the, the attraction of the, of the social world, the unique social world that a lot of these activities have. And something like the the, the uh, social prescribing mechanism is an is an in for a lot of people, I imagine, around that. And over time, you develop that attachment and a sense of identity with not just the social group, but with the doing of the activity. Uh, so you, you can see, you know, very clear parallels with with how, you know, initially socially prescribed activities might develop into more serious pursuits. Of course, for many people, this will remain a casual in, a casual intervention. You know, it's a short lived, pleasurable, and there's some immediate benefit in terms of my own kind of self confidence and maybe maybe I feel better about myself so and kind of uh, subjective well being. But it's not something they they end up committing to long term. And obviously, we can get into why that might be the case. So, yeah, lots of parallels. Really, really interesting. You can see how the model uh, fits with that broader perspective of leisure. Thank you, Sam. 
I'm just wondering um, what uh, Nicola and Liz um, uh, are thinking when they're listening about your explanation of the serious leisure perspective and the link to the social prescribing model and the research and evidence base about social prescribing engagement and benefits. Yeah, I can make some comments on that. Um, yeah, it's interesting to listen to Sam speaking that, that way about serious leisure. And I'm going to focus in my comments on arts and prescription because, because that's where I do my research and where I kind of observed what's happening and taken part in. And that's where I've kind of and done my research. So, yeah, I've noticed some clear parallels. But I think um, when people are engaging with ops on prescription, um, I think they do have autonomy and choice at the beginning, selecting the activity that they might want to do with their link worker. But um, they often need support. A lot of the time in the qualitative research, people are talking about the need for someone to actually give them permission to put themselves first, gaining the confidence to be almost allowed to do leisure, to do something they're interested in, being allowed to take the time out of their lives. Um, so it's almost like someone else that first is holding their hand, giving them that permission to, to do something that might become meaningful for them to engage in. So that's something I spoke, and that can be an issue because sometimes people drop out, um, and sometimes that can be, be because of the challenges or self-confidence con um, self or social anxiety of going to the group. So one issue is how to actually best support people to, to make that time to carry on with, with the, the activity they've been inspired. But they were using the term prescribed, um, it's not like the, a doctor is going, I am prescribing you this. You have no, no kind of choice in that. I think um, that's just almost like a catchy term that's used. It doesn't necessarily reflect exactly how organic it is and how much choice people do have to participate. Um, we definitely see uh, in the research that people are growing and developing their skills throughout the course, for example, arts and prescription. And it's a key theme that comes out in the research, the pride that people take in their self-mastery of new skills, a confidence, and even a shift in their identity, for example, seeing themselves as an artist. And in some of the research, this has led to people... Um, actually setting up art practices, setting up groups for people to carry on making art. And there's a kind of shift in an identity towards becoming seriously involved and linked with a um, particular top, um, leisure they're engaging with. So it can have um, significant kind of shifts and meanings for a person's identity in the long term joining these groups. Of course, in these qualitative research studies, you tend to get people who want to talk about their experiences and who it's been most meaningful for. So there is a, a kind of bias in that literature. But it does seem to suggest that it's very meaningful long term for people in some cases, at least. Um, yeah, and social bonding, like Sam was saying, seems to be a really key and important aspect. But it also has downfalls. So sometimes people don't feel part of an in-group, don't feel supported in a group. You're not choosing necessarily who is in your leisure group with you um, or your art group. And so sometimes there can be issues with a lack of social bonding if they feel they don't connect with some people in the group. And it also can be an issue at the end of the, say, 12 weeks of art workshops if people are feeling very connected and protected in this shared space um, and are bonded with the group, what happens when it ends? So that's an issue that we have at the moment of how to help people at the end of that group. So sometimes well-being can dip, but there's almost a fear of it ending. So, yeah, those are some of my, my thoughts, but there's definitely a number of parallels with what Sam was discussing. Thank you so much, Nicola. It's, um, this was so... Um... It was such an interesting and juicy answer. I, I feel like I can throw the, the next bit to anybody in the group. And I know there was um, points where both Kat and Liz, uh, Liz wanted to, to come in. I wonder if you would allow me, though, if I throw this back to Sam. And um, so, Nicola, you posed a number of issues with the sustained engagement and continued um, growth and the links to identity. And there was just so much that I know Sam was going to link into uh, the, the serious leisure concept, but also what we can learn from serious leisure about how we sustain engagement in these kinds of activities. Uh, Sam. 
Yeah, and it's, uh, I, I, I agree with Nicola. The, the parallels are there. And I think, I mean, not being completely au okay fait with the literature in social prescribing and particularly in the arts context, but you, you know, just in, just in the words and, and, and how uh, Nicola's described this, uh, it, it's been really, really, really uh, interesting just for me, just, just trying to unpack that a little bit. So in terms of uh, knowing, <laughs> Knowing what the what the the key kind of determining factors for sustained engagement in serious leisure are, you know, it's very much horses for courses in terms of, you know, it's a very individual thing and it's very, you know, it's very uh, very much different for different activities. Uh, but certainly, I, I I can pick out things like the you know the social cohesion and uh, attachment to a a clear you know social world. Um, you know, particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the literature around some of the adventure sports, for example. I see a lot of parallels between that and what Nicola is talking about there in terms of the art based kind of practices. Um, and, and Serious Logic started actually out in amateur theatre. This is where the, the, the whole kind of perspective is rooted in theoretically. The research started there. So th there's a natural home there as well. And, and it really did come about through the what made these social worlds distinctive and what drew people in and kept them there that, uh, you know, that then meant they become a serious as opposed to a, just a casual activity. And very often, like I say, it is the, it's the, the strength of attachment through social, those, those social bonds. And what's really interesting is some of the literature tells us that, or shows us that um, people might leave that social world for any number of reasons. And for, and for a number of years, a long period of time, but then be drawn back in. And I think that's really interesting as well. And, and, but I like the, the parallels I, and the, the point that Nicola was making about people then the shift in identity. Well, that's, that's fundamental to serious leisure. You know, it's, a, it's not just an attachment to others on the, on, on the level of, you know, we are in this together. We have a shared endeavor here in this activity. It's also now an extension of my own self you know, in terms of my own mastery or my own sense of, you know, worth almost, you know, in terms of being, I don't get that anywhere else. I only, I get that here. And I, you know, I will choose this over that all the time. That's how the, the seriousness of the activity grows over time. So, but that, that shift in, in identity, I think is, is fairly um, consistent across the literature. Marie, you want to come in there? I just wanted to, um, I found it really interesting that you mentioned worth then actually, because one of the measures that we take with the students that we work with is their worthwhileness. So we work with um, the students to um, assess how worthwhile they are feeling um, pre, during and post um, the programme. So mm -hmm. um, immediately after taking part in an activity, as well as at the end of the six weeks. Um, just reflecting on the um, results from last year, we noticed um, almost a three point marked increase in their um, worthwhileness. So looking at a scale out of 10, um, they, their marked increase of worthwhileness was quite substantial um, just from a six-week program. So if you're thinking about um, these students taking part in something and um, maybe it's something that they're taking part in for the first time or it's something that they're learning or um, they're connecting with others and those those, um, those ways to well-being essentially, aren't they? Um, they they're so key to those students that their feelings of worthwhileness are also improving from that. Yeah, I, I'm glad you've made that point because, you know, it's, that's a fairly new connection in the context of serious leisure, actually, you know, it's, it's association with well-being. It, it's there, it's inherent, it's, it's an implicit, but it's only starting now to really be understood. In the, in the US, uh, they have this concept of uh, therapeutic recreation, which is a very similar concept to this, uh, you know, uh, prescribing of leisure. Um, but just in that as well, I think a key point before we, we hook into to Liz, um, who's, who's going to hopefully uh, elaborate on things, is uh, just on the on the previous point as well, but feeding into Marie's uh, fa fabulous answer there, is this idea that actually, well the, well, the misnomer almost, that serious leisure is almost always positive. You know, well, it's, it's not actually, but because it is so serious to these individuals and there is that need to per persevere. Yeah, so very often it becomes serious or grows to become a serious activity through overcoming, I mean, adversity is maybe a too, too strong a term, but certain levels of challenge, whether that be a social, you know, social challenge, physical challenge, skill-based challenge, 
you know, but it's it's that overcoming that, becoming more confident, competent, and feeling worthy that really holds people in. And that's how this the idea of a serious pursuit develops over time. Liz, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I'm just interested at different words and different fields for similar things, isn't there, concepts? So obviously I'm in psychology and health psychology, and hearing you talk about some of those concepts in serious leisure makes me think about mastery. So we talk about mastery a lot in exercise and health psychology. We talk about building self-efficacy, which is a really buzz term in health psychology, which is about, you know, building up your confidence confidence in your ability to engage in a certain behaviour or activity. And uh, that's really seen as pivotal to people sticking with um, what we would term a behaviour or an activity in psychology, is that if you can build people's self-efficacy and belief that they can engage in activity to a good standard and they know the ways to engage in it and the different behaviours and processes that they need. So that might be the arts activities. They might be how to ride a bike. It might be whatever it might be, climb a, climb a mountain, she was saying. And they get that often through practice, but also through other aspects as well. So it's, it's interesting. I think a lot of these uh, concepts and constructs are really well evidenced um, in health psychology, actually. Um, and, uh, yeah, very similar ideas with slightly different terms. And um, the other thing I wanted to say was about worthiness. So um, one of the things we've just done some interviews with people who've come along to arts on uh, referral, arts on prescription groups, and a lot of people talking about feeling shut out of the art world. So um, feeling as if the arts was not for them because of the background or culture that they're from, um, their age, their gender, their culture, their ethnicity. Um, and interestingly, you know, that allowed them to be part of it and dip their toe in it and gain a bit of understanding about what's out there. And there were some really nice quotes, and I'm afraid I don't have them to hand, but just to paraphrase, really, about now suddenly feeling like they can go to museums, that they could reach out, they could, you know, get involved in what's going on in the art world. And they felt legitimised by coming along to these groups that it wasn't this closed book for them. And I think there's something about that prescribing. You know, I, I, I'm, I think the term is complicated. I completely agree with you. But that whole process of saying to someone, no, you could go to this. This is what's available to you. Has, you know, has that sort of, um, it, not empowerment's the wrong word, but it sort of gives people that permission. I think other people have said that, that they are welcome in that sphere, in that field. And I think increasingly people feel unwelcome um, because of their lack of engagement with these things in the past. And if they are going to become involved in a serious leisure activity, they first need to begin by trying it out. And this is what that gives people, is that opportunity to try something out that perhaps they never felt was for them, you know, didn't fit them, wasn't, wasn't what people like them do. So I think that that's a, a really important opportunity there with social prescribing to um, to democratise this to people who might not always find it easy to break into these areas. Yeah, I think just going off of that, Liz, um, social prescribing, one of the main elements of it is is that it's more than signposting. And I think one of the one of the things that um, a lot of people kind of don't understand as much is that. Sometimes for a lot of people, you can signpost till the cows come home. But if if they're not willing to do it, if they're not in a position to to be ready to engage, then they're not going to engage. Um, and actually, social prescribing is that is that kind of giving the permission to, or and almost inviting that person in to say, actually, you are welcome. You can engage. You've got permission to do this. And it's something that we see with the students that we work with every every student, essentially. Sam, were you about to say something? I was waiting for permission from Petia. Um, <laughs> I've been told off before. Um, so I really like, <laughs> I really like uh, the, the, the slightly different tack now that we've taken on this idea of social prescribing. Uh, it's highlighted an, an, an issue, I think, that is, is behind all of this, and the, this idea of socialisation. And, and, Marie, you, and uh, Liz, you talked about democratising these things it is opening people up isn't it and uh, to 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 the possibilities of things that maybe they felt through their own socialization and backgrounds that have been closed off to them and i think that this this is a really interesting point as well so you know why why haven't these individuals had the opportunities to do these types of things even though they've they've communicated to you 
Marie and Liz, you know, I'm interested in this. I would love to, there's about 50 things I would love to be doing, but through various, my, through my background, my socialization, the experiences that I've been able to take, you know, take hold of, you know, they, those things haven't happened or been closed off by other choices. Um, so I, I, I think just drawing attention more than anything else, not really want to get bogged down into, you know, the, you know, the idea of socialization, socialization as such, but I think, the, it's important to recognise the role of social prescribing in that socialisation process, um, at least as I understand it, as you're talking about it. Liz, would you say that's the, the case? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, and, uh, I, yeah, socialisation, uh, yeah, in psychology means quite a specific thing. But I, but I, yeah, absolutely, people's experiences and st- and stigma, I guess, around you know leisure time. I don't know if you've talked about this on the podcast, but you know it is it often is stigmatised taking time for yourself, isn't it? And I think particularly if you're thinking from a health psychology perspective, people who have, you know, who are unwell or have mental health issues, I think often feel quite guilty about taking time for themselves um, or, or knowing how to. And I think that that's that can be a key factor for people. They don't feel that some of these activities are for them. They don't feel worthy of them and perhaps haven't been helped to engage with those things because it can be quite hard can't it to start something new I think if you've never tried it before if your life has never been about the arts or exercise or music how do you start unless somebody sort of really helps you to understand that world you know the terminology what's out there what's what the opportunities are and I, I, if that yeah, that's what you mean I think by by sort of socialization I, I think um in that context I'm conscious we've probably got different terminology because it goes for different perspectives but yeah I yeah I agree I think it's really important people have the opportunity and, and it can give people the opportunity to understand everything that goes along with those activities. Thank you Liz I know Kat wants to come in here. Something that really interests me about what we're, what we've touched on here is really thinking about how, um, for myself as a practitioner, let's say, how we can take from the social prescribing model a much more kind of enabling culture, which is something we're trying to do at the Centre for Music. So that, um, let's imagine that we're trying to use that model of making it easy, making it accessible, making people believe they can be part of a community invited to it, that they don't need the specialist language expertise, background training, that they're a welcome guest in that activity. Um, because otherwise we, we sort of, we're, we're limited then, aren't we, to just the people we can bring onto the program. And I, I love our social prescribing program and uh, the commitment we've got to our students there. And my dream world would be that it, it could be bigger, that we could, we could have more, that we could support more students, that we could open that up to staff. But of course, that will be a slow and, and challenging process. On the other hand, I'm interested actually whether, whether anyone today would like to comment on how we can try to learn from that model to at the very least try to throw open the doors of these different activities um this podcast is especially targeted at staff uh but yeah just thinking about how within our different kind of practices you know um exercise in your case marie music in mine um arts and craft nicola and liz are the things you bring to the social prescribing program how do we position those things so that uh the social prescribing bridging model um, can operate even when we're not doing a structured program with a coordinator and with a, within a sort of clinical model, you know. Um, it's certainly what we tried to do with the Centre for Music in terms of how it's marketed, but it's, it's very challenging. Uh, and Petia told us on an episode where she was telling us about her interest in, in improvised theatre, she needed uh, somebody with her to push her through that door, <laughs> you know. Um, and we don't, all, don't all of us have access to those relationships that will give us that push so then what can we do that can give people the, that little pull um, and help them know so i'd really appreciate any any thoughts on that honestly uh, thanks kat i think this is an excellent transition into our kind of question and answers um segment of, of this podcast so let's start with the really interesting question that kat just posed to all of us i saw uh, liz had her hand up uh, liz could you start us off please I was just going to comment, actually, I'd written down um, a quote from the King's Fund who said, you can only prescribe something that exists. 
And I think that's one key thing to think about if we're going to extend this out is we need lots of activities to prescribe people to or to send people to. So at the moment, we have a very small pilot programme at UWE, which is working brilliantly. We have some wonderful activities from the Centre for Music. We have lots of stuff going on at the Centre for Sport. But we need, you know, we need the capacity. So I think that's one big thing that we need is that we need places to send people and great programmes where we know people are going to have a positive experience. So I think it's about providing those activities in order for people to be able to access them. And as we kind of commented on a little bit, so making those accessible as well. So inclusive, thinking about who runs those programmes, who attends those programmes and who um, feels that they're for them. So, you know, currently we have programmes that are being delivered as we could d deliver them but it'd be really nice for those programs to grow into sort of really inclusive spaces um where everybody feels like it's for them so that might be involving a different mix of staff it might be involving different types of activities we know there are certain students and staff who don't engage with our current offer because they don't see themselves reflected necessarily in the offer that we have so i think it's about um increasing the offer would help so it's about having those places for people to go. But I think we did a great job. But obviously, there's always a lot more we could do in that if we were, were further supported to do so. And thank you, Liz. Um, I know Sam is um, keen to come in here and he indeed has permission to do so. Wonderful. There you go. You heard it there first, folks. Um, so she's given me permission and this will be it now. Game over. Um, I, I like that. The point that Liz just made there, particularly the quote uh, from the King's Fund, and it reminds me of something. Um, so my background, sports coaching and and fitness, and uh, a big part of that is I mean, there's a phrase, again, I'm paraphrasing here, but you can't be what you can't see, you know, and, and really modelling, modelling practice, modelling, because you know, it's a discipline, isn't it? There's, there's, a, there's a discipline inherent in any practice, whether it be play music, art, you know, whatever fa facet of art it might be. So, you know, it's and then it, that might alienate certain people because they don't feel like they have, you know, they're, they're familiar or very fame with that discipline. But, it, you know, so, yes, we've got to we've got a model for that. Uh, we've got to create the programs, yes, and bring people to it and find ways of more accessible and inclusive means of doing that. But you can do all of that. But if you haven't done, if you haven't negated or, or faced up to the issue around culture, and the stigmatization of doing something for yourself that doesn't necessarily benefit the working environment, i.e., you know, it's not a reciprocal relationship here. Well, yeah, I'll let you do that. It's a bit like your research. I'll let you go and do your research, but it's going to come back and we're going to gain something from that, i.e., reputation, money, whatever it might be. This is a wholly individualistic thing. So if we don't first do something about breaking down that stigmatization the culture of academia more broadly we've spoken about this in previous uh previous podcasts and i can get very very emotional about this um but it is yes we've got to create those spaces but for me it's about dialogue it's about changing the conversation um you know through this you might find other avenues of interest and god forbid they're not the work related you know but it's it's broad a broader conceptualization of well-being that's what we need cat over to yourself Oh, just one sentence, Petty, very quickly, just say that just leading on from what Sam has said, that in many ways, this embodies why I wanted to talk about social prescribing in our podcast, because what we're trying to do is legitimise the place of leisure in people's lives. It's not well legitimised in the lives of our students. We know this. It is even worse trying to legitimise the place of leisure in our professional lives. And in the experience of the pandemic, that becomes even worse with the lack of physical spaces for us to go and normal barriers and divides that we could put in place to try to make space for ourselves and our well-being and health. So I'm really glad that you said what you said there, uh, Sam, because I, in a way, this embodies why a social prescribing is particularly relevant and beneficial to this discussion, because it puts leisure back on the table as a legitimate and important priority for all of us it's you know it's not a bit of fun and games on the weekend Marie sorry I'm just going to really quickly add I know we're running out of time um we were talking about permission right with the students that we're working with and how these students need permission to engage it's the same with our staff the staff need permission to have the time to engage in the activities that they know are good for them thank you Marie I think that's right <laughs> I think 
this is a really good um yes everybody is uh saying pre preach and um having visual signs saying what marie just said is um is absolutely really really important I think this links very nicely to a question we have uh, in the chat from um, a member of our live audience. Uh, and the question is around peers' example and involvement in, in, in activities and whether that can help accelerate making the leap into a new activity. And I also wonder whether the example of peers can not only have the, the kind of the moral support of getting involved, but also be an aspect of that legitimizing the activity, other people are doing it, so it's all right. Um, and also whether we sh that means we should talk more freely about having leisure lives, having lives outside of our studies, having lives outside of our work, that, 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 that then this becomes a legitimate thing to engage with and talk about. So I was wondering if any of you want to come in uh, to talk about the importance of peers' example as an involvement in, in this, please. Sam? Yeah, it's, it actually, it's a really good question. Really, really good question. And it links into a note I made earlier on. I think when uh, Liz or Nicola were talking about um, mastery and self-efficacy and actually, you know, how there's there's another side to that. And the, the other side to that is uh, recognition from others of that mastery and, and you know, the, the, the uh, ability, I guess, and that acceptance yeah, I'm now part of a group and how that's really, really important. And it actually dovetails into a, a body of work around what's known in, in leisure studies, at least leisure sciences, as enduring engagement uh, and how these are key kind of determining factors in that. Um, so, you know, the, the peer component is part of that broader social social world. Um, and sometimes uh, that can be challenging. I, I'm the newbie here. And of course, I'm going to be comparing so you know for the psycho social psychology room social comparison you know th th there's that comparison of well you've been here 10 years and you're far better than i am at x y and z i'm on the i'm at the beginning here but then what you tend to find to happen in many cases and certainly petty you've talked about this in previous podcasts is where those people that have been there longer or the more experienced have actually taken on a mentor role and pulled you through and, and said, well, you know, we've all started here. So that's, that's, you know, there's dynamic, the social dynamics are, you know, are, are for many of these activities are, are fundamentally important. Thank you, Sam. I, I, it's interesting you mentioned the word mentor. And I wonder if Nicola wants to come here and talk about the role of facilitators in creating these safe spaces for people to, to get involved with um, and engage with. Yeah, I think there are some similarities and differences with the socialising processes that seem to happen in arts and prescription groups. And to begin with, um, the role of the, the facilitator of the group is, seems to be really important. Um, people who attend these groups in the qualitative research often say they felt protected. It was a safe space that the facilitator created where they were allowed to play, where they were allowed to make mistakes, where they felt listened to, a very gentle and supportive atmosphere. And it's often that facilitator who seems to kind of set the scene and the culture within the groups. But as time goes on, they seem to talk more about bonding with others in the group. And one person who I interviewed about their experiences said they'd found their tribe. And they ended up staying together with a group of people and forming their own kind of um, art workshop after the end of the prescribed period and started what they called craft and noon sessions at a local venue and carried on almost like you were saying some mentoring others um, um creating kind of move on group for other people to go to to continue their art experience and their bonding their social bonding through that process so some really kind of powerful kind of social connections seem to be built but at least an important part of that is the facilitator of these groups and the, the special skills. They're not just artists leading these groups. They're not like art workshops. Another person I interviewed said they'd tried to go to another art workshop, but they stopped because it was competitive. People were telling them, oh, you're not using the right kind of art watercolor technique there. And they said, that's not what it's about. It's about supporting each other, playing, enjoying the process. Um, and more about kindness and competition. So, yeah, that's some of my... Uh, Thank you, Nicola. 
this is actually a really um, interesting and important point to, 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 to close our podcast on. And, and it, it links really nicely to, to a comment from, from our live audience, who, audience that states, perhaps giving yourself permission to take part needs to go hand in hand with giving yourself permission to fail and be mm-hmm. a beginner. And, and that's such a huge topic, both for the self-identity and confidence of our students, kind of early in, in, in their still, still young lives, uh, but also the importance uh, that we have often discussed um, in, in, the, in preparation for this podcast in, in academia, where excellence is so important. And, and actually reacquainting yourself with being a novice and failing can be quite a challenging aspect of engaging with new things and trying new things and joining new tribes. This was a fascinating uh, podcast. I think the time has just flown by. And I, I also feel like we've only scratched the surface with this. I really am grateful to all of you for joining us and for your contribution. I hope our live audience have enjoyed being part of this and contributing to the conversation. We have an evaluation link for our live audience to to engage with. And also for those of you listening to this recording, I hope you enjoyed this podcast, that you found it thought-provoking. And there is indeed an evaluation link um, for, for those of you who have listened to this recording. Thank you, Kat, for taking part in this conversation. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nicola, for being a guest today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for joining us and telling us about your work at UWE. Thank you for having us. It's been it's been great. Thank you, Liz, for uh, really giving us insights into the psychology world of uh, social prescribing. Thanks. It's been really great. I could talk for hours about this, as you can probably tell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and finally thanks to our resident expert Sam for taking uh, part in this podcast Sam yeah, thanks so much I've really enjoyed it thank you okay thank you all and uh, we have plans for releasing further episodes we'll advertise these and you can find these on our Twitter feed and on e- on the UA internet uh, etc so watch this space there are more podcasts to come goodbye everyone